Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God. His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. Thank you to our generous underwriters on Sharper Iron, the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. And Luther Classical College, a college for Lutherans by Lutherans, opening in fall 2025. Learn more at lutherclassical.org. On this Monday, March 20th, we are studying John chapter 14, verses 22 to 31. In today's text, Jesus responds to a question from one of his disciples as to how he will manifest himself to the disciples, but not to the world. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us returning guest, Pastor Daniel Golden. Pastor Golden serves at St. Paul Lutheran Church in Parkersburg, West Virginia. Pastor Golden, welcome back to Sharp Iron. Hey, thank you for having me. I have a lot of fun doing this. As we get started today, Pastor Golden, give us some context. We're at the end of John 14. What should we know about John's gospel and the context leading up to our text for today? Well, just before this, a little insight that we're given from Jesus into the father and son relationship, and also a little bit of insight we're given into the son and disciple relationship um, and how it's related to each other. And then the, the key question, um, the key question that comes up is how, how will that be made manifest? It will be made manifest. And of course, Judas asks, why, why some and not others? Or why us and not them? Sort of question. Mm -hmm. And so we are on the night that Jesus is betrayed. This is Monday, Thursday. Judas Iscariot, he has already left, but now Jesus is strengthening his disciples. How do you think that context, that Jesus knows he's about to be betrayed and crucified, and he's preparing his disciples for that and even beyond, how do you think that context plays into the words that we're going to hear Jesus say today? Well, yeah, they're about to uh, they're about to behold the the whirlwind of the passion. You know, whether it be the forces of evil um, or the powers of darkness, as it put as it's put, that um, just before Jesus is arrested and taken away, they need some sort of uh, Jesus gives them comfort and a guarantee of what is to come, um, and, and even a, an exhortation of not being afraid. All right, so we are going to hear that continued discourse and even conversation from Jesus and his disciples in our text today. We're picking up with John 14, verse 22. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, to Jesus, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away, and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced, because I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me, but I do, as the Father has commanded me so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go from here. That's our text for today. That's John 14, verses 22 to 31. And so, Pastor Golden, we've been listening to Jesus for quite some time. There's been a few interruptions in his speech. His disciples have asked questions or made requests. Thomas, earlier in chapter 14, Philip as well. Today, the disciple who speaks up is Judas, in parentheses, not Iscariot. Tell us what we know about this Judas who's not Iscariot. We know very little. We know he's mentioned in Luke as Labaius, also known as Thaddeus. Um, but just Judas, not, a, not Iscariot, is only really mentioned in any sort of 
specificity in this gospel, in this reading, um, in this reading that's actually used for the, the Pentecost in both, in both the uh, three-year and the one-year series. Okay, so we're in the, the season of Pentecost in terms of the lectionary. We talked about that in previous shows, that this section of John's gospel where Jesus is instructing his disciples prior to his betrayal, arrest, and crucifixion, that is often heard in the church here in the season of Easter or in Pentecost as a reminder that these words are intended to strengthen his disciples, not only for the upcoming passion, but also then after Jesus' resurrection and in the early ministry of the church. So Judas is mentioned here. This is Judas, not Iscariot. This is his one claim to fame in the apostle or in the in the Gospels, other than when he gets listed in the the lists of the apostles elsewhere. So we don't really know much about him, but he is mentioned here. We've said before that the evangelist John often highlights some of the lesser known disciples of Jesus, even the ones mentioned prior, Philip, Thomas. They don't get as much airtime in the Gospels as Peter, James, and John, for example. So he's Judas, not Iscariot. He's not the betrayer. And he asks a question, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Take us into the question that Judas, not Iscariot, asks here. Yeah, and it is a fully loaded question full of about oh, 10,000 sermons in of, of itself, for sure. Uh, well, what does it mean to be manifest? It's not quite like an epiphany. There is a relate. It is a related word in the original language, but manifest, quite simply, simplest put, would be to make yourself known or to make something known. But it's also something specific. It's special, and it has intentions. Um, the disclosure of something coming to reality. In other words, to to make yourself known. So in his question, how is it that you, that you will manifest yourself to us? How is it you will make yourself known to us, meaning us, the disciples, and not to the world? Um, how will this be meant for us and not for others? Um, you know, so what is Judas asking for, him, for maybe even himself? Is there a little selfish part of this question? He, he may be just saying, you know, how am I know it's going to be you? How will I know, or even will I be included as one of the us? Um, but the real problem of, of, of Judas is not being conscious of a very sharp contrast between the spirit of the world and the spirit of Christ's disciples. Um, Judas now, he's, he's middle-aged in faith, whether he be mm. in his teens or in his 20s. He doesn't have the faith of a child who simply believes that the Lord will the Lord will deliver on his promises and neither is he the faith of an elderly person who trusts in the Lord because they can see in their life uh, how the Lord has worked with them in a, in a 2020 sort of way um, but Judas is trained in the spirit of the world and no we don't know much about him this is his claim to fame and another interruption of Jesus um, trained in the spirit of the world then he's got this question, how will you be made known? So, but on, so on one hand, Judas is far from judging the world for its alienating God. Uh, in other words, uh, it, he doesn't understand how can the whole world not believe this? But on the other hand, is he also asking with some humility, um, why should we, your disciples, be so special to be the only ones near you? So we've got all these different possibilities of what uh, what could be the real question going through Judas's heart at the time? So I'd like to refer to another part in John, um, John chapter seven, uh, verses three and four. A and I would, uh, I'd argue that Judas just may have this in mind. In John seven, three and four, so his brothers said to him, leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works you are do doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. So if Judas is remembering that, then, then quite perhaps, why aren't you showing, why aren't you going to make yourself known to the entire world, Jesus? Jesus, you should go and show yourself to the world. So Judas, not Iscariot, asked, how will this be to just us? Uh, mm -hmm. It kind of goes to the age-old question of what's going through the disciples' mind on this, in this late, late time in Jesus' ministry. 
what sort of king will this be? How will this come to, how will this come to fruition? And then when he makes himself known, how is he going to manage his kingdom if he's only making himself known to a select few? And I think of how this can, uh, you know, how this affects us in our day and age in our real life. I, I remember my days as a manager in corporate America, getting to know people is key. And I had to make myself known as a supervisor if I wanted to successfully manage my division or my department or, or, or whatever it might be. And uh, that, that's the ways of the world, right? That's the spirit of the world. Um, so Jesus is about to give him an answer in a, in a completely different sort of spiritual way. Okay, so I I'm, I'm appreciate you digging into that question, because this is one, at least in the context of, of this discourse of Jesus, that stands out to me as a little bit harder to pin down where Judas is coming from in this case. You know, earlier, Thomas, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Pretty plain where he's coming from. Mm -hmm. Same with Philip after that. Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. And you have in Jesus' own response, you know, how have I been with you so long, Philip, and you don't know this question. So, But with this question, it, it does seem a little more enigmatic, harder to, to pin down where Judas might be coming from. And so I, I think you, you've given a, a helpful list of, of how we might understand it. And if I'm if I'm following you right there at the end, probably the way we want to understand this is is Judas doesn't seem to understand the nature of Jesus' kingdom or the nature of Jesus' glory. To use that word from John, you brought up John chapter seven, where Jesus' own brothers don't understand and don't believe in what Jesus is doing. My mind also went to part of John chapter twelve, where where John the evangelist reminds us that. Some of the, the people who are listening to Jesus, they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. And that, that loving of the glory that comes from man more than the glory from God was even among some who were believing in Jesus. And so I wonder if, if that also is, is related here, that Judas, not Iscariot, perhaps has in mind the glory that comes from man, and that's what he, he's thinking he's going to re receive and see from Jesus— and he doesn't see how that'll jive with only manifesting himself to just the disciples. Is that does that track? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And Judas could be asking the question on behalf of of all the disciples at the time, because hey, we were there at the beginning when this whole thing blows up, and thousands and thousands of people know those those eleven can say we were there when it all began. Um, but so they're they're ensuing popularity is going to be limited. In fact, uh, it'll turn into martyrdom. All right. So we have the question then from Judas, not Iscariot. How will you manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus is going to answer that question. He starts in verse 23. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. That seems to be the answer to the first half of Jesus' question. How are you going to manifest yourself to us? Talk about what Jesus says in response to that part of Judas's question. Yeah, absolutely. Jesus, our Lord, he's simply emphasizing the internal character or the internal spiritual character of his manifestation. Um, the manifestation will be of a spiritual character, um, the character of his res revelation to come um, and of his kingdom. Um, now, in this statement of his, there's a, there's a particular mark of a disciple, right? A disciple who is over and against the world. The mark, the particular mark of a disciple is one of loving the Lord and one of keeping his word. Uh, you know, now, now these souls of these souls of these specific disciples will take in their abode, the father and the son beginning with the manifestation of the Pentecost. Uh, you know, I, I like to think of that manifestation as the, uh, the beginning of the ongoing manifestation of the Holy Spirit on how, uh, on how uh, the Father and the Son, will, we will come to him and make our home with him. And it's, it's, it goes back to abide in me, right? Yeah. Right. And, and again, this is where this section of John, you, you almost have to 
to read the whole thing at once to understand everything. You know, we're reading it in order as it comes verse by verse here on Sharper Iron. But, you know, abiding in me, that's what Jesus is going to talk about in the coming chapter. And and yeah. we've seen that as, you know, back in chapter eight, abide in my word, and then you are my disciples. So we see that here. So the, the mark of the disciple, the one whom the Lord will manifest himself to, that is the one who loves Jesus and keeps his word. Those two things go together. And then the promise is that the father will come, and, or excuse me, the father will love him. And then both the father and the son make their home, their abode with him. This is a, I mean, you talk about a, a special and a, a wonderful manifestation to actually have God himself make a home with us. This is a marvelous promise of Jesus. Yeah, certainly. And it's, uh, it, you know, it certainly begins in that spiritual manner. Um, you know, one thing I'm noticing with this verse 23, it's also a conditional statement. So just if the, if the gospel of John stopped right there, or if this pericope stopped right there, um, now we have a condition. Okay. I, a disciple, I need to love Jesus. And I, as a disciple need to keep my word. But as we'll see, as we go forward through these verses, we'll see, um, how the peace that comes to us will actually, uh, help take care of that conditional statement. Right. And that's, and that's where, especially, I think this is true in John's gospel. Again, you have to, to see all of these things together. So, I mean, for example, in the previous text, verse 18 of this same chapter, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. I mean, again, that's Judas is responding to that in his question. So we, we want to keep all these promises from Jesus together with words like this, so that we don't make this about my performance or my keeping of Jesus' word or only about my obedience, but rather see how the Lord comes to us first, and that then brings these things about in us. He works in us. Or again, to go forward to the next chapter where Jesus says, he's the vine, we're the branches. And the only way that we bear any fruit, like loving him, like keeping his word, the only way we do that is when we remain in him and he in us. So we want to, again, we, we need to keep all these things together lest we misinterpret them in the way that they're not meant to be taken. Certainly. All right. So Jesus then, that's the first part of Judas's question. How is it you'll manifest yourself to us? He says to the one who loves him and keeps his word, the father will love and the son and the father together will come and make a home. Then he answers the other half of Judas' question in verse 24. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. It, it strikes me that Jesus is much shorter in his response to that part of the question. There's a lot more promise and blessing in the first. And then when it comes to the, the way he's not going to manifest himself in the world, he's like, this is the way it is. There it is. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just kind of, it's as if Jesus were just to say, so also the opposite is true. Uh, <laughs> uh, in the statement of whoever does not love me and does not keep my words, you know, on the surface, uh, on the surface of just reading that clearly, if there is no love for Christ, then there for the disciple, there's not going to be any manifestation. Um, love for Christ is intrinsic to being a disciple. Um, love and keeping words as a disciple go together. They cannot, they cannot be separate matters. Um, so, and I think that's the meaning with this too, because whoever does not love Jesus also must, by its very definition, also does not keep my words. Um, it's a clear contrast for those who do not realize the clear line drawn between the spirit of the world and the spirit of God. Um, and then, of course, in that second half, he encourages us. Um, the words coming out of my mouth are the Father's. The word you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Even though, even though the sound waves are leaving Jesus' lips into the ears of the disciples, they are one and the same with the Father's. And this really this struck me quite a bit, because this expresses a, a profound unity between Father and Son. A unity more than just uh, dad and kid sort of relation, but th this father and son expresses their will through words. Um, it's how we express our will through words. When I ask my daughter to go clean her room, it's me expressing my desire for her to clean her room. 
But these actually, father and son, share that same desire. Uh, so the, uh, the the unity that comes out of this, it's um, he's not bringing something uh, brand new to the table in the in the will and desire of our triune and true God. Mm, yeah, I mean the the nature of the relationship between the Father and the Son has continued to be an important aspect of this entire discourse of Jesus, and will continue to be as it goes forward. And and as Jesus continues, also we're going to begin to learn more and more about the work of the Holy Spirit. So the the Trinitarian nature of the true God is a big part of this conversation that Jesus is having with his disciples in the upper room on Monday Thursday. I do want to go back to to that first part of verse twenty four. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the the point that you made about the love for Christ and keeping his words going hand in hand, I think that this is something that we especially need to keep in mind in our day and age, in which there is, it would seem, a great tendency to maybe pick and choose among the words of Jesus. So I, I like what he has to say here, maybe not so much here, but then I still claim to love Jesus, that option really isn't left open to anyone in this case, right? I mean, this is, if you're going to love Jesus, you need to keep his words, period. And if you don't keep his words, then you really can't say that you love him. And I think that's important for our, our day and age. Yeah, absolutely. Loving Jesus is on his terms. We like to love people on our own terms. Uh, what makes us feel good? What, what makes us feel joyous and emotionally positive in love, but um, loving Jesus and keeping and guarding his words are, uh, is what a disciple does. Hmm. Well, talk more about the word keeping, because you, you said keeping and guarding. And I think we often hear, you know, keep Jesus' words, and we think about obeying Jesus' words, which is certainly a part of it. But when you said guarding, that I think that expands the meaning. So what does it mean for the disciple to keep Jesus' words? Yeah, because in typical um, American English, if you say, oh, keep my word, I will keep my word, that's something where you're just like maybe keeping a promise or keeping your word on something. But but the sense of the word keep in Scripture usually has the, the same feeling of guarding and following it. So how do you guard Christ's word, right? Because he, he's telling disciples, if you love me, keep my word they go together. So um, how do you keep your how do you keep his word spiritually? Well, it's got to be kept in your heart and you have to keep hearing it. Um, you know, I, I think of this when I visit older people who are who are shut in and not able to come out um, and they can recite Christ's words from their heart out their mouth and they can say in the same breath that they love Jesus. Um, that, you know, it, it goes it goes hand in hand. So if you have a rich storehouse of his word, it's easier to keep and guard it. Um, also, when you're guarding his word, you're measuring everything else against it. Um, you know, if, if you're tempted to do something wrong or bad, well, um, uh, let me take a look at the word. Let me take a look at what the word might say about it. Um, is this right or wrong or is it a good thing? Um, that's how we guard it and keep it as a disciple in our lives. Hmm, right. So o obeying it is certainly a part of it, but not every word of Jesus is a word that is meant to be obeyed. Many of them are words that we simply believe. And so to, to keep it, to guard it is bigger than obeying. And all of then the great effects of keeping and guarding that word in our hearts, as you said, become manifest. Now, you, you singled out our older brothers and sisters in faith. Mm -hmm. What about us, us younger brothers and sisters? How do we keep and guard those words as well? Well, for that, um, you know, th think about the, uh, you know, I'm come from, I come from the world of corporate management. So I was thinking terms of time management. So um, back before I went to seminary, I would spend one hour a week um, keeping guard on the word of God. And in church, I would hear it. Maybe I would remember it. Maybe I wouldn't. But what opportunities are there out there for um, what opportunity does your church give throughout the week, whether it be in devotions, whether it be in Bible studies, whether it even just be in the, if you just go to the Bible study before or after your worship service, you are there by doubling your time hearing the word of God, and you are more apt to, 
to keep and to guard it in your life and to, mm. and to recall those words when, when all of a sudden there's a need for them. Sure. And, and just the way that even within the worship service, the liturgy sticks itself into our minds and into our hearts so that we, we know those, those moments. I, I can recall ah, yeah. going to a, a youth gathering with some youth one year and the, the presenter, the Bible study leader started to sing, create in me a clean heart. And, and the youth in, in my group, they all started to sing along without having anything in front of them. They just knew those words because they'd sung them so many times. So the, just that regular, you know, being in the word of God, in the worship service, in the Bible study before or after, these are ways in which God puts his word into our hearts so that we would keep it and guard it there. So that, as you said, whenever it is that we need it, whether we are young or old, you know, it's there for us because the father's made his home there with us. And that's, I mean, again, that's such a wonderful promise. Why wouldn't we want that? Certainly. Yes. Yeah. So wonderful words here from Jesus, strengthening his disciples prior to his passion and crucifixion, and also strengthening his disciples after his resurrection, even still today. We're going to take our break, but we will be right back. You're listening to Sharper Iron here on KFUO. We're talking about John 14 with Pastor Dan Golden this morning. We'll be right back. Please stick around. What do you think of when you hear the word college? Expensive? Liberal? Woke? Imagine a college that is affordable, a college that is unapologetically conservative and Lutheran, a college that won't take a dime of federal funding, a college that teaches the best of our Western heritage, a college where students grow in the Christian faith instead of leaving it behind. This is Luther Classical College, a college by Lutherans and for Lutherans. Visit our website, lutherclassical.org, subscribe, become a patron, and join the thousands who are making Luther Classical College a reality. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Monday, March 20th. We are studying John chapter 14, verses 22 to 31 with Pastor Daniel Golden. He serves at St. Paul Lutheran Church in Parkersburg, West Virginia. Pastor Golden, prior to the break, we were looking at Jesus' answer to Judas's question. He again has asked, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? We've heard Jesus answer that. Do you, do you think his answer continues in verse 25, or is he, he kind of moving off into a, you know, into a new topic? Uh, well, uh, yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right. Both. There's a, there's a, you know, there's a reminder of something coming, of course, but then he'll also, uh, he'll also begin to, he'll also begin to answer Judas's question of how. Okay. All right. So in verse 25, Jesus says, these things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. And then in verse 26, he talks about the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom he will send. So what's, what's the move Jesus is making? How is he continuing to answer and also continuing just to teach his disciples here? Yeah. Yeah. There's a, here's a reminder that there is an imminent departure coming. Um, the time of the times of these uh, direct personal communications between Christ and these particular disciples are, are, are coming to an end. But yet, um, their discipleship is not ended. So even though there's a pretty short line from Jesus on some, on, on some what seems to be bad news, um, he expresses good news immediately following in the helper of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. So their discipleship is not it's not ended. This is not the end of learning. It's not the end of growing in knowledge or studying. All of that um, shall continue. Um, and uh, the, now the helper is not also, is also, it's not like he's a, a substitute teacher. Here, the paraclete specifically, uh, well, for one, this is, the, this is a place where the paraclete is specifically named as the Holy Spirit in, in the original language. Um, so before you go too far from that, you're using the word paraclete, which in the ESV is translated the helper. And I think we've encountered this, maybe not this exact title, but at least the verb was used of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I know it was in back in verse 16, another helper is the same, same word. So remind us about that term 
it, the paraclete, as you're using in the Greek, remind us of the kind of the nuances of that word. Yeah. So um, I, some synonyms for that might be like the intercessor, um, but it's an intercessor that is holy. Uh, so it's got a it's got consolation that's along with that. It, it's one who pleads a case. It, it's one who okay. helps make manifest, if you will. Okay. Okay. So that is the word that is again translated helper here. Sometimes it does get translated intercessor. Intercessor, maybe advocate or comforter or a consolation. These are all nuances of that word. And here Jesus very specifically says the paraclete, the helper, is the Holy Spirit. So talk to us about the work of the Holy Spirit that Jesus teaches about here. Sure. Um, You know, being sent by the Father, the Holy Spirit sent by the Father in Christ's name. Um, and this is, so it, it's very interesting that it's, that the Holy Spirit is sent particularly by the, by the Father and not by the Son's special request because uh, any disciple made any sort of decision to love Jesus, but sent by the Father in order to answer the how, to, in order to manifest and to glorify the Son. Uh, now, now we have uh, coming together, beginning the coming together for us is this express unified will of God that will continue in that same desire. All that Jesus said, which are also the words of the Father, will also be brought for us in this continued discipleship, this loving and keeping the word and learning and studying and growing. All of that will also be um, in the words of the Holy Spirit, and that will be there. I love this, teach and bring to your remembrance. So um, this is the actual purpose which Jesus states the Holy Spirit is coming. We need to be continued to be taught, and we need, we need to be continued to be reminded. So um, why do we need to be reminded? Well, um, we, we could first talk about sinful man, because I forget every now and then, more often than not, I forget to take out the trash. And I get reminded, take out the trash, um, you know, but it's also, it's also part of this entire world. So we just got a puppy uh, about a week and a half ago, and the puppy now knows how to sit and now knows how to lay down. But I, I guarantee you that I had to repeat that and remind that training to that puppy at least a hundred times. <laughs> and I've probably been reminded to do the dishes and take out the trash a hundred times too. Um, but the Holy Spirit's work is to teach and to remind all that Christ has said to the disciples. Uh, this, these, these, this doing, this work of God, teaching and reminding, is uh, ascribed to the person of the Holy Spirit and cannot be separated. Uh, you know, how can this apply to us today? Maybe, well, um, it cannot fool you. It doesn't have a different will from the Father, Father and the Son. Um, the Bible is not written from a different point of view that, that might have a different will or a different desire, um, more than just the words of the will of man, to, to be sure. Um, so with this Holy Spirit, they're not going to be taught something brand new that they haven't heard before. Um, you know, even in, in church uh, every Sunday, that which is taught by the Holy Spirit is that what the apostles had heard from Christ. And the apostles didn't just hear the New Testament stuff and write it, but also how it brought to completion the Old Testament stuff. Even Peter at Pentecost, the epistle for this same in the lectionary, uh, he preached Old Testament. He, he, he quoted it in his, uh, actually in his first two sermons after, after the mm-hmm. Pentecost. Um, and Luther actually speaks of this a little bit too. Um, Luther protests uh, protests against Roman traditions in this way. Um, Roman traditions they contain a great deal of what the Holy Spirit had to teach something new after the apostles' times that they had never known before. So Luther protests that. Um, so this is that which the apostles had heard from Christ. They're going to be continually taught it. They're going to be reminded of it, and they're going to write it. The Holy Spirit's going to guide them to write the same. 
Now, I'm, I'm glad you brought that one up about the Holy Spirit guiding the apostles to write these things down, because I, I do think that within this verse, there is a promise that is very specific to these apostles, that when they write the New Testament, they will write it correctly, that, that they are not simply writing their own recollections, but this is actually the Spirit bringing to their memory the things that Jesus actually said. You know, I mean, I, I, I think about like when, when someone someone will, will listen to, to this show and they'll say, Pastor, remember what you said <laughs> to that guest? Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes I do, <laughs> sometimes I don't. And, and to think about, you know, how did the apostles recall everything that Jesus said during his three-year ministry? Well, here's the promise that Jesus makes to them. You will remember because the Holy Spirit will bring it to your remembrance and you will record it then accurately. And so I, I think this is a fantastic promise for us to keep in mind when we think about the reliability of the Gospels particularly, but ultimately the whole Scriptures, that this is the work of the Holy Spirit so that His Word is in fact written down. I think that's really important. And then what you were saying as well about you know what the Holy Spirit brings to remembrance is nothing new, but it is the Word that Jesus spoke, and I think that does continue to have ongoing importance for us as Christians so that we would be able to clearly discern where the Holy Spirit is at work and also where He isn't. You know, how do you know if the Holy Spirit is at work or not? Well, is the word of Jesus faithfully being proclaimed? If so, then that's the Holy Spirit at work. If not, it might be another spirit at work. Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't believe that the, uh, you you never convinced me to believe that these apostles had any sort of writer's block going on at the time. That's like right. Like we experience yeah, sometimes. That's right. That's right. And that's because of the, the help of the Holy Spirit that Jesus promises here. So yet another verse in the scriptures to keep in mind when we think about the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Jesus makes that promise here in John 14, 26. The promises just keep on coming. I think John 14, 27 is one of the better known verses within John's gospel. Jesus here says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Give us the goods from Jesus' promise there. Yeah, this continues to answer the question of how can this be for some and not for others. So we begin with, well, what is peace? Um, well, peace, peace here is not some sort of feeling of pleasure or happiness. It's not subjective. Um, the peace that Jesus says is my peace. So this is his peace we're talking about. It's, a, it's an objective peace. Um, generically speaking, it's a, it's an objective state of health. It's a condition of absolute body and soul well-being. And how did this peace come about in Christ to get handed to us? Well, if we recall the words of Isaiah, uh, actually in Isaiah 53, verse 5, but we, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds, uh, we are healed. Now, in his word, and Jesus says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. This is not some sort of a mere rep repetition. Um, he makes a statement, and he also, in his second statement of peace, it's also an explanation. Um, first, it's the peace that no one can give except for Jesus. This is, uh, you know, I'm reminded of the, the peace of the Lord that will be with you always um, at the conclusion of the words of institution of the sacrament. It's not a greeting. Uh, this, is, this is not a, something akin to, the, to Paul's kiss of peace, if you will. Uh, this is a blessing. Um, that's why we say amen after that, and that's why we don't say, and also with you. Uh, Jesus obtained that peace by going to his Father. Um, and it's only his that can do it, for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. He further explains that uh, he's talking about his, his giving of this objective peace, this absolute well-being, are his. My peace I give to you. Um, it's essentially different, his way of doing it, his way of giving, that verb, it's essentially different from the world's giving. His giving is set apart from the world's giving. And here's that clear line between how the spirit of the world is versus uh, the spirit of the kingdom of God. Um, now, we know that we know what the Lord gives is different, but here is how the Lord gives that differs. 
Um, the world will say like peace, peace, and there is no peace because it's just mm. hollow phrases. It's the sound waves that come out of our mouth. But it's when it, when it's the when it's the the words that hit the ears that the source comes from Jesus. He gives peace in a way that passes all understanding, and it's not hollow. It's got a substance. There's weight behind the words. You know if. Uh, um, and here's what I mean by weight and authority behind the words. If, if my wife says to me when I get home tonight, um, you're under arrest. Ha, ha, ha. That's funny, honey. Whatever. Mm-hmm. Now, if the police knock on my door and they say you're under arrest, all right, that's got some weight behind it because you've got some authority behind those words. Now, imagine the, 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 the holy, perfect um, authority and substance and weight behind those words of peace, peace. Um, of course, he goes on to say, let not your hearts be troubled. Well, here's the opposite. Um, yeah. The opposite of peace is when your heart is troubled. So in other words, let not your hearts be troubled. Hold to the peace. Hold to what he gives you and what he, and how he gives it to you. Um, the world's peace is going to give you trouble, um, especially in, in Jesus' preparation now for his disciples in this upcoming great disturbance that they're going to have in their hearts. And that's going to see their, they're going to see their teacher, um, their friend, their, their, their king go through a passion and death. Um, you know, they'll find out later how this will come to fruition. This peace comes to fruition for the disciples in the resurrection. Um, this peace also comes to us in fruition in the resurrection in that upper room when he says, peace be with you. Yeah, that's right. I mean, that's the first thing that he says to his disciples when he sees them again. I love that. First After words his, out of yeah. his mouth. Yeah. 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 I mean, and that, that really, I mean, puts the bookends on it. You know, he says, here's my peace ahead of time. And then he solidifies it. And you, you know, you mentioned how it shows up in our liturgy, particularly there right after the words of institution, peace be with you, and it's amen. But even elsewhere in the liturgy, peace really is all over the place. You know, many pastors will conclude their sermon with with words from Philippians 4, the peace that passes understanding. Mm-hmm. It's in the it's in the dismissal from the sacrament. It's in the benediction. The Lord give you his, you know, his peace, right? Over and over again, this is what Jesus comes to give us is his peace. And as you said, like when he's the one giving, then his words have that weight. You actually have that peace. It's an objective reality that you just can't get anywhere else. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, I think of, uh, you know, being a pastor, it's what I, what I do every week. I hold the, I hold the body and blood up, up in the air as I'm saying it. It's kind of like, yeah. here's, here's the means of peace in this, you know, as we're going through the worship service. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Wherever Jesus is present, there he is with his peace for you. Yeah. And so that's what he's promising his disciples here, and he will continue to do that throughout his ministry. In verse 28 now of the text, Jesus continues, You heard me say to you, I am going away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. Now I've told you before it takes place so that when it does take place, you may believe. Take us into those next verses. Oh, gosh. The way we think and the way God thinks are complete opposite. Um, For us humans, for us disciples, for those disciples, um, they think that because they love him, that what they're about to go through, all they can do is be troubled and sorrowful over his upcoming departure. But in divine thoughts, the Lord thinks... If the disciples love him, they should and must rejoice over it because it means that the son is going to the father, because it means that the son is going to a state of exaltation and glory. Uh, Yeah, it's it's from his, this is his time of humiliation, and he's right on the cusp of his exaltation. And uh, one thing that Luther says that during this time, in his time of humiliation, And this is a quote from Luther. Jesus was a poor, miserable, suffering Christ. But now with the Father, he's a great, glorious, living, and almighty Lord over all creatures. And darn it, if you love Jesus, you should rejoice over that. Because he's going to, he's also can do something for us from there. Uh, He's also telling us, you know, in that second verse, uh, he's telling us before it takes place. Telling the disciples 
before it's about to happen. And, um, it, you know, but that's going to result in sinful men um, not believing. But that's normal spirit of the world stuff. So, but he mentions why. So that it, when it does take place, when it does come to pass, that you may believe. And what comes with the believing? Well, actually, it's the rejoicing. It's the rejoicing when they see him again after the resurrection. Um, it's going to be a few days later than when they should have rejoiced, but they, they, they shall rejoice. Hmm. Just briefly, uh, Pastor Golden, where Jesus says in verse 28, where he says, I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I, that language where Jesus says the Father is greater than I has sometimes caused some some trouble among Christians, especially having not long ago heard Jesus say the Father and I are one, and and you know all the Trinitarian implications that come with yeah. that as to who we believe about Jesus. If I understood you correctly, as you were talking about what Luther says, when Jesus says the Father is greater than I, he's speaking in terms of his humiliation and and not in terms of that the Son is somehow less than the Father. Uh, yeah, yeah, it, it's absolutely where. The Son is in his humiliation, and the Father is in heaven, is in all glory. It's certainly not a comparison of, um, of the sons of Zebedee, one being better than the other. Uh, that's the way right. we would think about it. Um, it certainly is, uh, yeah, it, it's the Father in his great glory, what's going on up there, the living and almighty Lord. Right, So that such that this verse does not does not speak against the way we would confess in, say, the Nicene Creed when we say that the Son is of the same substance as the Father. This is not anything at all against that, but this is speaking of the Son in terms of his humiliation, that his, his the Father is greater than he, and so he is going to the Father, and that's going to then accomplish all these good things for which the disciples ought to rejoice. Yeah. No. So, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, no, 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 go right, ahead. One thought I had with that, too, you know, we, we hear through the Gospels about Jesus. Jesus is never one to self-glorify. Jesus gives glory to the right. Father, and the glory of the Father raises Jesus from the dead. Jesus doesn't raise himself. Um, it's even part of that um, mark in secret, um, why he doesn't want anybody to tell, because he's not out to glorify himself as part of that answer. Um, so he, I don't think he would ever say that I am on equal terms with the Father, especially during his humiliation. Sure. He he says he and the Father are one earlier in John 10, and that, yeah. that's certain, something, a, a verse, obviously, that we hang our hats to. And and I, I also read in a commentary that, that made the point that, you know, for anyone else to say something like, the Father is greater than I, like, if you were to say that in a sermon, or if I were to say that in a sermon, that would be practically blasphemous anyways, because like, well, of course the father is greater than you, <laughs> Pastor Golden, you know, like it, those words only make sense for someone like Jesus, who is the son of God himself yeah. to say, because of precisely because of who he is, and there's, not as a detraction. There's even a hint of coming obedience in that line. Yeah. yeah. All right. So just to, because I know sometimes those, those words do trouble Christians and have caused trouble in the history of Christianity among those who wanted to deny the, the true godhood of the Son. I thought it good for us to, to take a look at them. So let's continue then into what Jesus says. Verses 30 and 31, he says, I'll no longer talk much with you. The ruler of this world is coming. What is Jesus talking about there? Um, well, Satan, the ruler of this world, um, not a ruler by right, but ruler by just matter of fact. He who rules the, the spirit of the world, the prince of the world, um, is coming. Um, that is the power of darkness. That's, uh, it's me I think that's mentioned later in Luke. Hmm. Okay, so the, the ruler of the world is coming. So Jesus knows that his, his hour is at hand, as he said earlier in John's gospel. So the ruler of the world is coming. But what does Jesus say about the way he's going to face the ruler of this world who's coming? Um. Well, he's got no claim on me. So that the way that we understand having a claim on something is different, I think, than what... There's such a deep, rich meaning when Jesus says that the prince of this world has no claim on me. Um, because Satan's power, it's all about self-reliance. Self and there's actually a, an emphatic double negative in the original Greek in this line. In other words, it's, he has no claim on me None. No, you know, so he's got no hold on me. None. Um, he stresses, uh, Jesus is stressing out that, uh, stressing out emphatically 
um, that Satan has no claim. So what is this claim that he will try to have? Well, the prince of this world, the ruler of this world, is going to come and try his uh, self-reliant power against Jesus, attacking him in the darkest hours of Christ's passion. Um, and the ruler of this world, he does this through men, through sinful men who, who act as his tools. Even um, during Christ's agony in the garden on Thursday in the book of Luke, uh, Jesus states the presence of the power of darkness. And right after Jesus states that is when he is taken and arrested. And even in Hebrews, it says, well, the devil has the power of death. Now, but that death, that power has no claim on Christ. No, not a bit. Um, it's, hard to ex it's hard to stress the, the emphatic double negative that Jesus has there. But, um, but we know that that enemy will, will gain nothing. There's, there's no kind of sin. There's no kind of weakness that can give Satan any sort of hold on Christ. And, of course, Jesus speaks this before it happens. He's fully conscious of all this. So, you know, how does he, over, how does he overcome this? Well, quite simply, he does as the Father commands him. Um, mm. The greatest demonstration. Well, right. So that's where he, he goes in verse 31. He says he's, he's going to do as the Father has commanded him, and then the world will know that he loves the Father. To help us into those last couple statements of Jesus here. Yeah. So, yeah. The son does as the father commands him. Um, now, now we've heard, we've all heard and repeated the words, the greatest love that one can have for another, have for his brothers to die for him. Um, but yeah, this is something bigger and greater. Uh, the greatest demonstration of Christ's love for the father is to, is to obey him. Now his obedience um, leads Jesus to his passion. It leads him to his cross, his death, and his tomb. It is Jesus' obedience. It is Jesus' necessity of that obedience that leads to the forgiveness of our sins. It is not Satan. It is not Pharisees. It's not Sadducees. Um, it, it, it's not Pontius Pilate. They were, they were pawns in the game, right? Um, the necessity, this was the plan all along. Uh, the irony is rich in this. Um, but it is uh, he does as the Father has commanded him, so that the world may know that he loves the Father, that he is obedient to him. Hmm. The text that we have today closes with Jesus saying, "Rise, let us go from here." Do are we supposed to picture Jesus and his disciples moving at this point, or? Well, and the, the reason, and I know this is, uh, you and I probably won't be able to, to give the definitive answer. I understand that this has puzzled scholars and, and Christians for quite some time. You know, at the beginning of chapter 18, we're going to find out that Jesus goes out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley where there was a garden. So we know, or it would seem that he's not moving that far at this point, but but does it seem that there's a change of location or, or what should we make of these, these last words from Jesus and our text? I would say just from what we know in the text, we know that there's a, well, there's a posture, um, you know, and that's a posture common with teacher and students, right? When the teacher stands and speaks, usually the students are sitting down or even in the older universities, the professor would sit and all the students would stand, you know, it's kind of a, likened to that moment in the, in the beginning of the sermon, at the end of the sermon. Um, when I took that posture behind the pulpit, I could hear a pin drop. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it speaks a little bit to the posture that's going on. There's been a lesson here, and now it's time to move on. Now, what is that moving on? You know, that, that's, I'm just talking about the word rise there. Um, whatever right. posture they were in, they're about to change posture. So maybe right. not so much a teacher student posture but to something else teaching will continue but to let us go let us go from here uh, well what do disciples do that love him? what do disciples do that keep his word well they follow jesus they follow they've been following him for um up to three years and they're going to follow jesus in his way to the cross in our obedience um it's funny, right after he's right after he says something about his obedience to the Father, I do as the Father commanded me, then he gives a command. Rise, let us go, be obedient to me. 
That's right. Continue to follow Jesus, the one who goes to the cross and out of his tomb for you, and we follow him through death into eternal life. Pastor Daniel Golden is pastor at St. Paul Lutheran Church in Parkersburg, West Virginia. He's been helping us today to study John 14, verses 22 to 31. Pastor Golden, thanks for being our guest today. Thank you so much for having me. I am your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. If you have any questions for us, please send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. It is always a pleasure to hear from you. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again tomorrow.